Today we're talking about crowdfunding and the basics of crowdsourced validation. And the reason why this is the title is because crowdfunding in all of its forms, it's uh, basically a tool for us to validate our ideas in the market. Uh, most commonly because we start off and we want to see if uh, what we do resonates with our audience. Uh, there is a, another uh, uh, type of crowdfunding, I'll tell you about it in a, in a while, that has to do with companies, but uh, this is not our case today. So we're going to say what is crowdfunding, the types of crowdfunding, deciding whether crowdfunding is the right uh, for your project, is right for your project, the essential elements of a successful campaign, of course the example of Wordis, Yorgos is going to tell us all about it, and then we're going to set up a campaign, at least the basics of it, uh, through Indiegogo, which is one of the platforms out there. Whenever you want, uh, you can interrupt me. This is an open discussion and it's more about you than uh, running a presentation myself. So crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is the practice of uh, funding a project or venture by raising money from a large number of people in modern times, typically via the internet. Crowdfunding is a form of crowdsourcing and alternative finance. This is the definition given by Wikipedia. And uh, basically what it says is that uh, the idea is not finding investors per se, but rather find people that are interested in what we do. So they can uh, give a small amount of money and uh, being a large number of them being able to fund uh, whatever we do. So it's uh, fractional, it's not uh, like going to a VC or uh, the bank and getting a loan, uh, it takes a lot of people to do that. Now there are three main types of crowdfunding, the first one being donations, and this is something that is typical, typically used for uh, non-governmental organizations, social enterprises, community projects and the likes, anything that doesn't create a product that aims to bettering our life or the life of other people. Uh, there's nothing in return, there's nothing, at least there's nothing tangible in return, like a product or something like that. And it's mostly based on hyper-local interest. Some of them are international, you have very uh, large organizations running crowdfunding campaigns through donations, like, uh, I don't know, UNICEF, um, uh, organizations for pets or uh, refugees and so on, but mostly uh, this kind of crowdfunding campaigns uh, have uh, hyper-local interest. The problem with this is that people believe, and maybe that's uh, something that uh, in common Ruth uh, might be uh, it relates to, people believe that if we run a crowdfunding campaign because we have a just cause, people will uh, automatically um, be emotionally attached and uh, donate their money in order to support us. This is not the case. Uh, usually the cause, the way these kind of donations, these crowdfunding campaigns for donations are structured, uh, are detached from the emotion of the uh, people who are donating. Uh, there's nothing in return and there's no way they can relate to our cause. So the success rate is very low in, this, uh, in these cases. I will give you examples afterwards. The other type is rewards. And uh, th this is a crowdfunding uh, process that's fitting for tangible products. Let's say you are producing, I don't know, a mobile phone or uh, a cup or something, anything that can be uh, used as a pre-sales. Uh, logic. So they are pre-sales focused, this kind of campaigns. And the idea is that we usually do a prototype and uh, we make a campaign. There's a very compelling video about uh, what we do and uh, people know that if they give you their money, they will probably get uh, the product you are making in a discounted uh, uh, monetary value. And uh, the good thing about this kind of campaigns is that they are great for product validation. So you make a prototype, you set a goal. <coughs> Sorry. You set a goal and then you are basically sourcing the interest of the public and the audience you are targeting. And uh, if the campaign goes well, then the validation is there and you can start producing. You already have the first money for your uh, first production. 
and uh, it also gives you motivation uh, to proceed further. These kind of people are usually your ambassadors in a larger audience that might be relevant to what you make. And the third kind, which we're not going to analyze today, but in general, is equity crowdfunding. And uh, this is a way for businesses and startups to raise uh, funds. Um, they do not exchange uh, products or services for the funds they raise, rather they exchange equity. So basically they exchange ownership in their own companies. Um, the funders uh, take their place in the cap table, which means that we share our business with uh, people that fund us. And uh, the support is based on uh, dividends. Uh, for, you, for those of you who don't know what dividends are, is that uh, depending on the valuation of the company and the value that the company creates, at the end of the year, the stocks represent the monetary value for those that hold them. So these are called dividends. Uh, or revenue sharing depends on the agreement, meaning that uh, instead of giving out stocks, you might give out uh, revenues, part of your revenues. Or they take the uh, stocks of your company in the hope that at some point in the future you will have a, a big enough value for you to exit this investment, for them to exit the investment and gain some, um, uh, take back their investment times five, times ten, whatever, it doesn't really matter. So that's equity crowdfunding. One of the most successful equity, since we're not going to talk about it more, one of the most successful uh, equity crowdfunding uh, platforms in Europe is Crowdcubes. It's a UK-based um, platform owned by Darren, an old friend of mine. And uh, I think that so far they have uh, startups and businesses in that platform have raised more than uh, 1.5 billion uh, pounds. So, donations. The drawbacks of donations, as we discussed, these are typically community projects uh, or NGOs. Uh, the funders cannot easily relate to what happens. Uh, I'm giving you an example here. So Earth Church, the, ch uh, the church of stop shoppings, weekly Sunday service, new songs on the ground activism. Yes, but where? Is it relatable to what I do here in Greece? Obviously not. Uh, does it make sense in another state? That's a U.S. campaign, for instance. Does it make sense in another state? Probably not. Uh, another campaign, diverse leaders group, nurturing and developing diverse leaders globally who can lead uh, to charge, lead the charge uh, to equality for all. Okay, it's a human rights uh, campaign. Do, am I going to be a leader in that space? Uh, does it relate to what I do? Would I ever fund it for some reason? Probably not. So it's zero percent. It has four days left, and it's zero percent uh, completion. The thing, however, you, what you can do is engage with locals early on, because if it's of hyper local interest, then you need to make sure that your campaigns are relatable to the people on the ground next to you, people that are going to reap the benefits of what you do. Uh, you do not usually. It's not. It doesn't make sense to pick. Uh, platforms that are global, like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, these are some of the main GoFundMe, some of the three three of the main uh, crowdfunding platforms out there. But there are local platforms uh, or national platforms that uh, might make more sense because it has people that are more um, engaged with uh, what happens uh, on the ground where you are. For instance, if I had a campaign in Thessaloniki, I would probably not go to Kickstarter or something like that, I would probably go somewhere else. And uh, this means that you have to lean heavily in local and regional social media groups. Uh, so social media is one of the main channels for disseminating basically what you do so that more and more people learn about it. So by the time you are ready for your campaign, it actually makes sense for them to participate. They have understood what you stand for and they will uh, be more inclined to participate in a campaign about that. But here's another example. In, uh, I, I think it was last year, 2021, there was a campaign in uh, Get Funded. I, I can't remember the, the platform right now. So it was this guy, Lorenzo Neradis, uh, the guy is from Thessaloniki, Greece, and uh, he had the campaign, the Olibus 12 Refuge Trail, which is uh, something which is 
he was asking for donations, right? There were no rewards in essence. But what he did was clever enough in the sense that he promised that if we found him, and I did personally, he would send out a map with the trail around the Olibus uh, refugees, re refuge, the refuge trail. So basically it's a 100 kilometer uh, walk around the Olibus and you go to all the refugees and you can stay there overnight. So I did fund it. It was 69% funded, it wasn't fully funded. Uh, but uh, then again, I received a map. So I'm, uh, to be honest, pretty grateful that I did because I think either this year or next year, I'm gonna go there. Now, the smart thing about that is that they found something meaningful, meaningful to reward the people and cheap, of course, to reward the people that would fund the campaign. So some of the ways you can do that is by making your own ebook, uh, badges, guides, showcase your supporters on your website or something like that. You know, make people think that they are part of your journey and this would allow them to more easily uh, relate and uh, at least uh, think, know that they are getting back, uh, getting something back out of uh, the money they quote-unquote invested uh, in your efforts. So that would be a smart way to do a donations campaign. Do something simple, cheap, that you can send out to the people that uh, have supported. Uh, for uh, Capsimo, for instance, if you ever decided to do something like that, uh, you're probably producing something out of it, or you can prepare a guide of what to do with your coffee at home, or something like that. The uses of coffee, leftover coffee beans at home, or something like that. So that would make sense. I mean, people would actually get something uh, from a campaign like that. Now the rewards campaigns are in essence three sales campaigns and the idea is that uh, you have a prototype, you have a very nice video, maybe some, most of it is probably fake to be honest, but uh, what you are showcasing is what you can do, uh, what the value of it is and how it relates to me. In that sense, uh, a campaign for uh, something tangible like a tent in this case, uh, for, like the um, light, uh, repel the powerful and portable mosquito killing ever, the most uh, powerful and portable mosquito killing ever, and uh, the Astro e-bike and so on. These are things that are tangible. These are things that if I give you money, I'm supposed to get something back from you. Now, as you can see, this kind of campaigns, uh, the light repel, uh, repel it something that was funded 17,000% more than the money that was requested, than the goal of the campaign. Uh, the Astro Bike was funded 1,600% more than uh, what it requested. And there are numerous examples like that. Another example, for instance, was a campaign that uh, there were two brothers and they made I don't know, the honey in Greece uh, that is very uh, thick. But in other countries, because it's from, uh, it's a different kind of uh, honey, it's very watery. So the, what they did is they made a honeycomb, honeycomb and uh, on the back of it, they introduced a, a faucet. So basically you would open the faucet and the honey would run down your jar. That was so successful, they ran something like 10 campaigns, if I remember correctly, they collected something in the order of 200 million uh, overall, some, a ridiculous amount. And uh, the, uh, the thing about that is that people that would fund them because they knew they would get something back that made sense to them. So it's a pre-sales campaign overall. It allows you to validate market interest and uh, if there's no market interest, then you don't have to produce anything. Uh, the thing is that you have to grade your rewards. Some things are more expensive. For example, the bike here, the Astro bike, uh, e-bike is uh, an expensive item. So there were some graded rewards that were cheaper, much cheaper. Uh, you can provide discounts. Uh, and of course, you need to make sure that you can deliver. So we'll talk about that in a bit. In uh, any kind of campaign like that, it's all about the perks, all about the rewards. So uh, you have to make sure that the rewards are relevant 
Uh, so you are targeting an audience. Uh, the rewards that you are the perks. Uh, the rewards are the perks. Basically. The perks that you create have to be relevant to your audience. If your audience is 18 to 25, then it has to be something that uh, um, reflects energy, um, youth, uh, things like that. Uh, it has to be cost effective for them to be able to participate in your campaign. It has to be meaningful in terms of uh, having something as a perk that doesn't relate with what you're actually doing, doesn't really mean anything because at some point or another down the road you want the people that get your perks, even if it's a badge or something like that, you need them to become customers uh, eventually. So it has to be meaningful in terms of what you do. Uh, you need to be creative. Uh, mundane things don't fly usually and uh, there have been so many crowdfunding campaigns out there uh, and you need to be much more creative than the others in order to draw attention. And of course, whatever you uh, promise as a perk has to be doable. It has to be something that you can actually do either within your skill sets, within your budget, within the time frame and so on. Otherwise, it's a very bad um, publicity for your brand, your company and whatever you do if you do not deliver. Uh, and uh, I have here from Indiegogo, uh, there's a video, there's a whole chapter about explaining uh, how perks work and uh, I would really suggest for you to, to go through the, the video. So is crowdfunding right for your project? The question here is are you ready to hustle? And you have to ask yourself certain questions before you do that. First of all is are you the person that can actually make a plan for the next three to six months? Do you have the right skill set to produce uh, whatever you do? I mean doing something as a hobby, it's far, far more different than doing something in a production uh, uh, setting. So if you don't have the skill set, you need to know that you can actually source the skill sets uh, from your local ecosystem. Uh, one example, uh, I had a friend here in Thessaloniki, he did a, a campaign about, a, it was a, a sleeve-like structure for mobile phones and the idea is it would turn your mobile phone into a handheld arcade uh, game. Now, they did a prototype that was uh, rapid uh, and fast, but when it came to production, they faced a major issue. And uh, this meant that they had to go through a learning curve to understand how production uh, works, how production works in large numbers, and they ended up uh, traveling to China just to find someone that can actually make what they promised at the uh, actual price that they promised. So you need to be able to know this stuff before you start uh, your campaign. Uh, do you know, do I know how much uh, I'm seeking to raise? Having a campaign doesn't mean anything. Uh, having a campaign means that it doesn't mean anything if you don't know what your, what your goal is. There's two types of goals. Uh, in campaigns. Uh, the first one being able to uh, solicit market interest just to see what's going on and how many people react and what their feedback is on what you do because in all of the crowdfunding platforms there's a discussion section where you talk with your audience. Uh, so and the other uh, kind of campaign is the one that you are actually pre-selling with the goal of raising uh, enough money to create a business out of it, a, a viable uh, business. So these are two different goals, so you need to be able to know how much you're seeking to raise in order to um, address the audience the right way and of course prepare the campaign the right way. Do I know where my audience hangs out? That's very <coughs> important. Usually when we start, when we have an idea, the typical uh, reaction is everybody's going to want it. Yeah, okay, this is one way of putting it. The other way is that you don't have money to attract everyone, so you need to attract the early adopters. You need to attract the people that are more, let's say, ready or um, relevant to what you do right now. So once you decide what your persona of a client is, then you need to know where they hang out because before launching anything, there's a whole campaign that uh, a whole part of the campaign that has to do with recognizing your channels, uh, trimming your message, and then be able to uh, attract this kind of audience. 
Another thing is that is, is there sufficient value in what I'm making? And the, this question has more to do with an, uh, a discussion with yourself of whether your hobby uh, is relevant, it has enough value for anyone else. It might solve the problem that you have, it might look good in your eyes, but is there enough value for everybody else? So that's a question you need to ask yourself and the one of the easiest ways to do that is just to go out and showcase what you do or talk about what you do with friends, with even people you don't know and uh, just ask them what they think about it. It's not a solid feedback, it's not something actionable, but at least you have some intent uh, or some um, uh, understanding, let's say, of uh, whether the value is there for people to take notice. And one other question is, am I willing to dedicate the time and energy required? Now, a crowdfunding campaign can be, uh, can fail easily. Actually, the numbers uh, from a report I read are uh, that about 40% of campaigns uh, result in a full funding go. So the rest of them, 60% fail. You, which means that you have to ask yourself, are you willing to dedicate the time and energy required prior to launching, which is about a three month period preparing everything, during the campaign uh, <coughs> being live, which is about one, one to three months, and of course after the campaign, because you need to produce what you promised, in order to produce it, deliver it, it's all the logistics, you need to organize everything. So do you have the time and the energy to do that? If you don't, I would strongly advise you not to, to, to start towards uh, something like that, to put your effort towards something like that. Maybe something else would be more relevant to you. So, any questions? I have a few, if yeah. uh, nobody right. else wants to go. So, regarding the, the production, um, I've seen several campaigns that have, um, uh, of course it depends on the product, but there are several campaigns out there that have a very really limited production. So, for example, 50 pieces or 100 pieces, which means that they will never go into a larger scale of production and mm -hmm. they might not reach to the point that they will be able to understand that what they have made cannot be uh, reproduced easily and uh, cost efficiently in general. So what's what's the what's the proper approach here? Should we try to get our numbers as low as possible so that we can uh, deliver ourselves, or should we try to go to larger numbers uh, with the risk uh, of uh, having the problem that's, that you stated in terms of production first? Yeah. There's uh, two ways to go about it. As we said before, it's whether you want to validate your idea or the, whether you want to go to production and the viable business. A typical case nowadays, in the beginning, when the crowdfunding campaign started and there was this kind of excitement and everybody uh, was saying, oh yeah, innovation and new stuff and so on, people went for large uh, goals, for large enough goals, 100,000, 200,000 and so on. So in the process they would basically promising that they would produce enough items for that kind of goal. And many of them failed, even if their campaign was successful, they failed to do that. So there is a, sort of a, um, the audience that visits crowdfunding uh, platforms is now a bit reserved for newcomers. And the general advice is that if you are going for validation, go for small numbers. Let the audience drive you into larger ones, uh, if that's possible, but do not overpromise and under deliver. So if I was making something right now, I would probably go for scarcity. And this is a good way to, to attract audience very fast, that uh, I'm making a limited range of 50 items, let's say, and you're going to be the only 50 people in the world that have them that would give me enough validation, speed would give me enough validation, discussions would give me enough validation, and 50 pieces would allow me to do something that I can handle. Now, if the validation was there, the next steps I would do is I would make another campaign with a, with a much larger number if I wanted to go that far. So 
the typical case nowadays, if you are a newcomer, is to go for a small uh, campaign. And if it actually makes sense, then you have to decide whether you want to go for a larger campaign. Does, does this answer your question? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think Yorgos also has raised his hand, so perhaps he has something to add. Yeah. I just wanted to say that in my point of view, uh, the limited edition, the 100 uh, production of, of something is most of the time uh, made from people that they already made something before and uh, they had a quite big crowd and they want to do something for uh, a very limited numbers. So it, it is a little bit different in my uh, area where it is like a game or like a, a, an art thing than in a production of uh, a machinery or something uh, different. So in each case you have to think that it is a, a little bit different. For example, if an artist, a well-known artist, creates something about 100, then they would make a completely hit. Whereas somebody that doesn't know um, know us, if we make 100, it is so most of the time uh, in uh, art, it, it is not going to work at all. So, as Nico said, it is more to what you are creating. And uh, rather than, uh, and also the audience that you have already created. That was my point of view. And uh, uh, that that's uh, that was a very good point, and uh, it's a very good overpass to my next comment that had to do with the audience. So besides the the general perspective of, about the audience that uh, who are your customers, let's say in you know, the market, etc., is there also uh, a difference among platforms? So are there people that are more keen to visit, for example, Kickstarter if they are looking something on art? Don't know. I'm just saying or uh, Indiegogo for something else. So depending on the audience, the starting point of the platform itself should be different. Right. So in the beginning, like, just like uh, let's say seven, eight years ago, and even before that, I think the first one was GoFundMe. Uh, it was in 2010, something like that. In the beginning, each platform has its own niche. Uh, the Kickstarter was more in the tech domain, and Indiegogo was more in the creative arts domain. And then you would have some other platforms that were more in the uh, NGOs and donations and stuff like that. Nowadays, what happens is that you pick the platform that has more of an audience in one particular domain. Let's say you would pick for an art-related project, you would pick something like Indiegogo. And then if it makes, uh, if it is successful, then you would also go to Kickstarter and GoFundMe and so on. So now it's more fused than it was in the past. There are some uh, uh, main elements of, a, of an audience preference per platform, but the, the limits are uh, fused nowadays. I don't know if it, what, you, what else you can do is you can go to Etsy. Uh, there are some platforms that work not as a crowdfunding platform, but as a pre-sale platform, so to speak like Etsy, for instance, those who are more into the artistic uh, things uh, know about it. And there you can showcase something, put a price on it and see if anyone is interested, but it's not a crowdfunding platform per se. It's more like direct e-shopping, right? Yeah, sort of like that, yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. I don't know if there are any, any other questions. I wanted to ask something. Um, so what do you think? I mean, it's a very general question, maybe. But uh, um, when you when you are trying to create to make a crowdfunding campaign, is it better to go like as a as a like natural person or to have a legal entity first? First of all, you will need a legal. That's a nice question. First of all, you will need a legal entity to sell. But when you go for a crowdfunding campaign, uh, you go as a natural person or a team of persons because you need to convey the passion that you have for what you're doing to other people. 
So if you go as a company, this kind of emotional connection is lost completely and uh, you need to showcase the, the reasons that drove you towards something new and what it means to you and the people around you. So it, it is always better to do that on a personal level. I mean, if it's, it's if, it, if we're a group of people, we can mm -hmm. actually go, we can actually, uh, I mean, my concern is that we are going to uh, raise some money that uh, are going to be credited to one of or many more uh, bank accounts, I'm guessing. So, like, is this, um, yeah. how no. did you handle that? Is yeah, it... the bank account that you give is the bank account of the company, let's say, right? But, this doesn't have to do anything with the campaign. Okay. This, but if, these if are you... logistics with the platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. But does it answer your question? Uh, my concern is that if you are a group of people and you don't have a company, then uh, is it a bit trickier or not? The amount of money that you raise from money will go to one account. So if you are a group one of account. people with no, with no legal entity, mm -hmm. I, first of all, I advise to get a legal entity. And <laughs> secondly, it cannot be split. It goes to one account. Because okay. one, one person has to be responsible for this kind of transactional level between the team and the platform. That seems okay. So if someone else wanted to ask something, thank you, Nikos. I think they interrupted someone before. Someone was trying to say something, right? Yeah, it was me, Christus, but now the question is answered, so thank you. Okay, so moving on then. Essential elements of a successful campaign and the idea here is to be diligent. There are stages that you need to follow and there are actions that need to be performed. In terms of a timeline, it includes the following stages. Project brief, you have to decide what the project is. You have to decide on the rewards or perks as they are called. You have to prepare a plan for uh, your public relations and how you can disseminate on that. You have to prepare yourself for the pre-launch, which means that there's an amount of time that's needed in order to prepare everything before you launch. Uh, you have to have a pre-launch, go out and uh, reconnect with the people and then say, tomorrow we are starting, tomorrow we are launching. You've been talking to them for about three months. And then the later stage is when you are in uh, production. So you need to be able to handle the logistics of uh, making something uh, at scale, if it's at scale, or at least making it and uh, sending it out to the people that uh, uh, fund it. The actions that are needed, you need to prepare a video. There's no way a campaign today can be funded without a proper video. And the video has to be able to showcase, as I said before, your passion or the company's passion towards what they're making. You need a landing page and the reason for that is that you need people to go there and find even more about you and see that you are real, you're not just creating a campaign somewhere. <coughs> uh, in the case of Kickstarter, there's a page campaign, so you need to be able to, you need to know what are the main elements of this page uh, Kickstarter page campaign or Indiegogo, it doesn't really matter, any kind of platform. What are the main elements and how can you present it the best way? Uh, you need to decide and uh, prepare your content and your distribution, obviously, of the content. You need to build the relationships, design, graphics, and marketing. So there's loads of things uh, taking place uh, during a campaign. And in terms of a timeline, three months before, you need to be able to build this is for a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, all the links are uh, in the references, so you can go and uh, read all the articles. Uh, you need to promote the game, or co in this case, it's a game company, actually, uh, well before uh, your campaign starts. So the last three to four weeks before the campaign, you need to generate the excitement and uh, get everybody ready with uh, a newsletter or uh, uh, a timeline or uh, what have you, just inform them all the day, media, influencers, articles, whatever, it doesn't really matter, depends on the kind of uh, thing you're making and the channels that are relevant to you. 
it is advisable to run a campaign for 30 days. Usually what happens is that campaigns, people set up campaigns for three months. The problem with the three month campaign is that it does not create scarcity. So people do not have to act now. They can act within three months. People forget it. The kind of marketing you need to do must be much more intensive. It must be much uh, more prolonged. And it's, it's good to prolong that if there is enough interest, but not to do that when uh, you launch. And of course, you have to update uh, your contributors uh, every day and uh, keep them engaged and excited uh, with what you do. And this is something ongoing even after the end of the campaign, throughout the um, uh, production phase and the distribution phase uh, of what you make. And the idea is that if they funded your project now and they find interest enough, at some point you're going to have something else or you want to extend your project, right, or your campaign, then you need to keep them happy and you need to keep them engaged because these are the, the main uh, source of funding you're going to get even moving down the road. So it's not a thing that you prepare, you know, the day before or the week before. It's something that takes much more. In this case, we're talking about uh, four or five uh, plus, let's say, three for production and distribution, eight months, eight to nine months. It's not an easy process. This is why I said before that you need to make certain that you are willing to put in the time and effort to something like that. Uh, one uh, quote from uh, Crowdfunding Uncast, the founder, uh, if you launch your campaign with zero audience, you are losing to crickets, which means that the, the amount of effort you have to put afterwards, you know, to get people involved and engaged and interested in what you do, is probably, you're probably going to run out of time. There's not enough, actually you need to <coughs> be able to understand how the algorithms of this campaign, this crowdfunding campaigns, crowdfunding platforms work. If you get enough interest on the very first early hours or days in your campaign, then you move up the ladder and you are uh, what the platform call the uh, trending ones. So a trick in that is that you have a couple of friends ready. So when you start the campaign, they buy, they, they fund you. So this indicates to the platform that uh, there are people interested and they put you up in line uh, towards the trending ones. But the idea is always, always that you have to prepare your audience way beforehand. And you have to get them anxious to get your campaign launched so they can fund you. And this would make a, a successful campaign in the end. Thank you.